the army had pretty well disarmed the U.S. zone of Germany and put the people that wanted in concentration camps. The third IDA was to move to more permanent quarters in Darmstadt. I still did not have a radio assignment, so continued to drive when there was driving to be done. I had collected considerable things in my stay at Melsungen, so I went to the commander to see if I could make an extra trip with the things I could not carry all at once. It was okay with him, so I went to Darmstadt with a load about 75 miles south of Melsungen. I have not checked the distance, but it's south, right south of Munich. One day, I wanted to see how long I could keep my foot on the floor in a jeep and found that I could do it for 30 minutes. There was no traffic cops to worry about, just void poorly filled in bomb craters. There was no traffic on the Autobahn either. I found that a wartime jeep could go 67 miles an hour top. Later, I wanted to find out how fast the 42 Buick would go. So I got it out on the freeway and put the pedal to the metal. Just as I reached the top speed of 92 miles an hour, I heard something like it was trying to pass me. This was shocking because when I began the speed test, there was not another vehicle in sight. But with a roar, a P-38 zoomed past me low overhead. If this had been a few months earlier, I would have been a dead duck. Some bored fighter pilot was having his fun. So Blake and I got a room overlooking the concerns and still not offering a radio. In October, the major activity was managing the huge number of displaced persons. I remember a few hundred were housed in an abandoned empty warehouse. The same month, the division had settled down enough and for entertainment, it had organized a football league. We, we were allowed to go to Berlin to see the division football team play another team. I was not interested in seeing the football game as long as I could see Berlin. At the same time, the Allies were dedicating a monument to their victory over the Germans in the Tiergarten. I saw just part of the ceremony because I wanted to see the Reichstag where Hitler and Eva Braun died from self-inflicted wounds. I assumed the Allies made it out of the woods. I assumed the Allies made it out of woods so it could be dismantled easily. I have inquired about it since the war, but cannot find anything about it. I don't know the name of it, so it's harder to check. My bet is it my bet it is no longer there. I had to borrow a camera to take with me to Berlin, and it was a cheap German one that rivaled the cheap American cameras. It would be okay in the sun, but the day I went up was cloudy, so my pictures did not turn out very good. I've lost all but one or two anyway. Not all German stuff is good quality. We took an army bus to get there. On one of the stops, there was a crowd of people, of the freed displaced people, and one of them recognized a German as one of his persecutors. There were a few tense moments before the situation was diffused. The German lived. We stayed the night on the way up at an English post. For breakfast, we had fish, which was a shock. Most of us wondered how the English could fight with a boiled fish for breakfast. My friend and I wandered around the grounds at the Reichstag and found the underground bunker where Hitler and Eva Braun killed themselves. He had just married her a couple days before. This area is in the Russian zone, so not long after my friend and I were in the bunker, we were kicked out by the Russians. It had been picked clean, so there were no souvenirs to be had. I would like to think we saw the pile of debris where Hitler was cremated, 
but it might be just from my reading about the situation there after the war and it's my imagination. We did not know at the time what had happened to them, so we wouldn't know what we were looking at anyway. On the way up, some of the soldiers were collecting all the candy and cigarette from and other rations because they knew how valuable they were in Berlin. We managed to see a show in Berlin the night we were there. Not far from our concern, there was a prison camp. One time, after we had finally been assigned a radio job, they had brought some prisoners to police up the area, which we could see from the radio trailer. I guess just to give the prisoners something to do. Picking up cigarette, picking up cigarette butts was a no-no for if they were to, for personal use, for police in the area, okay. The sergeant saw one of the prisoners put a butt in his pocket, apparently, and made the prisoner run, drop flat, get up, drop, get up, drop, until he could no longer do it. This is the only thing I saw that would indicate how the prisoners were treated under American jurisdiction. According to James Bach in his book, Other Losses, the treatment Germans received under American, French, and I'm not sure about British prison camps, rival the Russian in ferocity of death and misery. I believe the one camp I saw, which I had pictured, did not fit in that category. As you can see, it is well maintained. It also was in Patton's command, so that might have made a difference, as Patton was not vindictive as those who had other axes to grind. Patton had not been killed yet. <clears throat> 